So I work for um, <coughs> Hewlett Packard Enterprise um, in our um, enterprise security services business. And um, I've been doing uh, information security for far more years than I care to remember. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today, though, is something which has been sort of kicking around for, well, quite a few years. Um, I was just um, talking earlier about it, and it's probably eight or ten years since um, I, at least, started talking to insurance companies about cyber insurance. But it really actually seems to be sort of taking off now, and I'd, I'd be interested to know whether anybody else in this room has... has been talking to anyone about cyber insurance or, or, or has cyber insurance or is thinking of having cyber insurance because um, I think it, it may be, it may be a, an idea that whose time has come, I'm not sure, but it may. So hopefully, yes, what I'd like to talk about is really what what we're trying to do here, which is to ensure against cyber risk and what cyber risk means. And, and can cyber insurance actually help with that? Okay, the title is, can we insure against cybersecurity disaster? Well, hmm, possibly not. But can it actually help to prevent disaster? Can it actually help to deal with the aftermath of disaster? Um, I'll look at the state of the current state of the cyber insurance market because it's quite interesting actually. Then I'll look at some of the challenges of why I think the cyber insurance market is, is in the state that it's in and how I think we, we might possibly meet those challenges and, and how going forward actually if we do meet those challenges actually cyber insurance could help to improve um, the overall um, capability of cybersecurity, not only in individual businesses, but also throughout the, uh, the uh, nation, potentially. So um, what is cyber risk? Now, anybody who knows me uh, will know that I'm very fond of this little diagram, which I call my hydrodynamic model of um, cyber risk. <laughs> so the idea here is that um, it's based on, on this, this ISO 27005 uh, risk and uh, uh, risk assessment and, and management definition, which is that, as you can see, uh, cyber risk or information security risk is the potential that a threat will exploit vulnerabilities and cause an impact. I'm shortening it, obviously. Um, so if you consider um, risk as potentially a huge tidal wave of threats, which is coming at you the whole time, you've got to throttle those back somehow. So you put in place some threat detection and, and action capabilities. Hopefully you throttle it back a bit. Then you put in place some vulnerability management capabilities. Hopefully you throttle it back still more. And then finally, you have to put in place the ability to deal with the impacts. And hopefully what you get out at the end is a little bit of residual risk. OK, it doesn't always work like that, but that's, that's the concept, really. That's what we're trying to do with risk management. We're trying to detect and prevent the threats. We're trying to manage the vulnerabilities, and we're trying to uh, manage the impacts, if you like. Um, so that's what we're, we're really talking about when we're, we're talking about cyber risk. So what are the options for dealing with it? Well, there's an interesting dichotomy here, I think, because the dichotomy is between the IT and the security people and the rest of the business. Because in IT, and, and, and particularly in, in, in security, what we try to do is really what I was talking about in the previous slide, which is to reduce or eliminate the risk. Now, that's all very well because, you know, IT security is thinking about assets, which are mostly technical type of assets. And our focus tends to be on the threats and vulnerabilities. 
I mean, I don't know whether you've noticed, but um, uh, we tend to be caught like rabbits in the headlights when we see all these threats coming over the horizon. And, and our focus does tend to be on those threats, even though actually, probably the majority of them don't actually apply to us. Vulnerabilities, we all know how those are difficult those are to deal with, but nevertheless, we have to try and deal with them. But that tends to be where the focus lies. The business, on the other hand, has far more options for dealing with risk. So it can accept the risk, and we hope, when uh, we, those of us who are involved in risk assessment and management, we hope that when we tell the business what the residual risk is going to be after we've done our job, that they're going to accept it and sign off it and say, OK, yes, mm, I understand that there is a risk involved in doing this. They can, as a business, also avoid the risk. So they can say, OK, I'm not going to do that risky thing at all. I'm not going to go into that business. I'm not going to move into that country. I'm not going to do business with that company. I'm not going to accept those type of customers. So I'm going to avoid the risk altogether. And the third thing, that the business can do, which is the interesting one, I think, and the one that we often forget when we're talking about cyber risk, is transferring the risk. Now, some people say that IT outsourcing is transferring the risk. It isn't. <laughs> it isn't. Believe me, when you go to an IT outsourcer or a security outsourcer or a managed security service provider, you're not transferring the risk. You may be transferring some of the actions, but you're not transferring the risk. So how do we transfer risk then? Well, cyber insurance is actually a way of transferring the risk. So what you're doing when you're insuring, if you think about it, when you're insuring anything, your house, your car, your possessions, you're actually sharing the risk that something will happen to that house, car, or possessions. They'll be lost or damaged or whatever. You're sharing the risk that that will happen with the insurer. And the insurer says, OK, you pay me a certain amount of money every year. And in return, if anything really bad happens to your house, car, possessions, I will pay you the value of them if you're lucky. So. That really is transferring the risk, or part of the risk, or sharing the risk with uh, an insurer. So, okay, can we do that with cyber risk? Let's have a look at the cyber insurance market. Okay, the first interesting thing is that the cyber insurance market is out there. It's two and a half billion dollars in size. But 90% of that is in the USA. Two and a half billion dollars sounds an awful lot. It certainly does to me anyway. But actually, two and a half billion dollars is only or less than a tenth of 1% of the total insurance market in the world. So it's a tiny, teeny, weeny part of the global insurance market. But it is growing. It's growing 300%. But, you know, even growing 300%, it's still only going to be a very, very small part of the global insurance market. So why is this? Well, obviously, as I said, 90% of the uh, cyber insurance markets in the USA. Um, uh, a company called Marsh did some uh, research last year, and they showed that nearly 50% of UK companies that they surveyed had no plans to take out any cyber insurance. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that not all liabilities are currently covered by cyber insurance. So, you know, you might get insurance for loss of customer information, which is probably the most common thing, uh, particularly that retail businesses are concerned about, loss of com cost customer information, personally identifiable information. The other thing that you might be able to get cyber insurance for is business uh, interruption as a result of some sort of cyber attack. 
interestingly, um, you may be covered for computer fraud through your other policies, you know, your, uh, your ordinary criminal and fraud policies, although I have read of cases where even that is a bit iffy, because they may say, well, computer fraud isn't really fraud as we understand it. But nevertheless, theoretically, you are covered by your other policies for uh, fraud. Um, reputational loss. Now, that is a very difficult one and is potentially huge. If you are a big business and um, somebody compromises you, say, your talk talk, um, you're going to lose reputation and customers may well switch away from you. You may well lose business as a result of that. Uh, how do you cover that? Well, some cyber insurers, some insurers say they might cover it, but it's again, it's a bit doubtful because, you know, how do you actually prove what you've suffered as a result of uh, reputational damage? So that's an issue. Um, the other thing that, that's not covered, as far as I can see, in any insurance policy is um, any form of uh, loss of intellectual property as a result of a cybercrime. Now, I know, and I'm sure that those of you who, who, who work in this area know, that there are an awful lot of bad people out there who are trying to steal intellectual property from companies. A lot of them in Russia, a lot of them uh, further east, and we know that they are stealing intellectual property. It isn't covered, as far as I can see, by any current cyber insurance policy. So that's, that's the problem with the market at the moment. So <coughs> I think that, that probably explains some of the reasons why the current take up of cyber insurance is low, because it only covers some of the risks. Um, the other thing is that obviously, well, insurance policies are always complicated. They sometimes we think they make them deliberately complicated in order to make it difficult to claim on them. But they are complex, and as I've already pointed out, some risks are co covered by some existing policies, some aren't covered. So it's difficult to know whether you're covered or not. It's an immature market. I mean the. The, the problem is that, you know, and I've been talking to, uh, to insurance companies and they find it extremely difficult to calculate the risk. I mean, the, the, the underwriters really don't know. I mean, if you told them what the risk was, they would calculate a premium and they'd be able to, uh, to, to give you some insurance on it. They find it very difficult because we can't, I mean, we can't really put figure on the risk so we can't if we as security experts can't help them how do we expect the the the, the insurance industry to, to to do it so they find it difficult um, organizations don't understand what cyber insurance can do well I, I pointed out that you know generally speaking most organizations don't really think about cyber insurance as a way of managing risk because they don't think about risk transfer. They think about risk remediation or reduction or elimination. And finally, organizations really don't understand what their risk is. I mean, we, we all know this. Those of us who do risk assessment, risk management, know that frankly, most organizations really don't do it very well, even if they do it at all. So those are some of the challenges and why take-up is low. Other challenges are, well, this is an interesting one. So the, the total risk exposure from cybercrime and uh, that sort of thing, I mean, you, can, you could choose any survey and I always say there's lies, damn lies, and survey data. It's very difficult to know what the total exposure is in the world. But one estimate there from uh, PwC is that it's $150 billion globally. Well, could be, could be $300 billion, could be $100 yeah, We don't know. It's big. It's a big, big sum. But 
the problem is, as we've seen, the actual insurance market is only worth 2.5 billion. So the exposure is 60 times what the actual insurance is worth. So as a result, insurers have actually, in, in a uh, survey conducted by PwC last year, rated cyber insurance as the biggest, or cyber, as the biggest risk facing the insurance industry. It's the biggest risk facing them. Why don't they do something about it? Well, okay. It's, it's got a low profile in business. This is the problem. Because, you know, less than half of UK businesses actually have cyber risk in their top 10 risks, which is a bit worrying. Um, and less than 20% of UK businesses actually acknowledge board level ownership of cyber risk. So it's really got a low profile. That's, that's one of the problems. Until it gets a bigger profile, you're not going to get organizations clamoring for it. If organizations aren't clamoring for it, protection against cyber risk or risk transfer, then you're not going to get the insurance companies taking up on it. Um, other things that we need to be aware of uh, which are coming over the horizon and I think might give the uh, market a bit of a poke, legal and regulatory concerns um, in Europe particularly with um, uh, data breach notification. If that comes in in Europe then I think there are an awful lot of companies who are going to be caught short by that sort of thing and that might prompt them to think about insurance. Uh, as indeed will increased fines for um, breaches, cybersecurity breaches. What's putting people off, of course, is the cost of this, because actually in, uh, surveys have shown that the cost of cyber insurance, where it is taken out, is about three times that of other sim similar liabilities. And the other thing is, so I talked to an insurer about this and said, well, how do you estimate the premiums? And he said, well, basically what you do is you look at the sector that the customer is in and you say, okay, you're in the retail sector. The retail sector had a whole bunch of awful um, cybersecurity breaches last year. Your premiums go through the roof. So 32% increase last year from 2014 for the retail sector in cybersecurity, mainly because of big high profile breaches like the Target breach. Whether, you know, if telecommunications are going to take one out, it's going to be bigger next year because of talk talk, I don't know. But, you know, big high profile breaches, that's basically what the insurers base their, 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 their premiums on. So it's a new market, there's a limited number of insurers, the insurers tend to be the big boys, they find it very difficult to calculate the premiums because there isn't the data, um, and actually the insurance limits are pretty low, usually less than 100 million, which may sound a lot, but when you're target and you get a big breach which costs you about 264 million and you only get 90 million back from your insurer even though you'd be paying through the nose for insurance then it's not particularly good or worth it or valuable to take out cyber insurance. Um, the final thing uh, I just want to mention because I think it's quite critical is how do we investigate cyber crime? Because, you know, if you are an insurer, you want to find somebody who, who you can get after um, when an event has happened. So digital forensics could actually be pretty critical to cyber insurance. And we all know that digital forensics isn't really terribly well carried out by most organizations in the aftermath of a cyber crime. So, it's very difficult to pursue the uh, perpetrators who anyway are probably located in somewhere where you can't get at them anyway. So there are all sorts of challenges. Um, and the other big challenge is, um, and this is a, this is a survey that, that I've been doing for the last two or three years, um, asking organizations to say how 
capable and mature they think they are in terms of their cyber security. And uh, if you take the uh, usual capability maturity model, you would expect that if you were going to be reasonably capable, you would achieve a level of three on the old um, Carnegie Mellon scale of capability maturity. Now, unfortunately, uh, you can't see it, but I mean, the slides will be available. The majority of organizations in the majority of sectors are below three in terms of their own assessed capability maturity. This is, this is a survey. This is, as I say, it's survey data, so you can probably take it with a pinch of salt. But if organizations are assessing themselves as below uh, capability level three, it does mean that the majority of organizations are probably not very capable when it comes to managing their cyber security. So that is another big problem. So, okay, if we do go for cyber insurance, if cyber insurance does take place, does it have any potential advantages? Well, in my opinion, yes, it does, because I think that it actually has potential to drive quite a few improvements. So, first of all, if you are on the board of an organization, and you are insuring against something, then you've got to have an understanding of what the risk is that you are insuring against. Because otherwise, why are you going to be paying out money without understanding why you're paying it? I mean, okay, you're paying money to insure your car because you know you have to, but on the other hand, you do understand something about the risks. Uh, the risks of having an accident, the risk of the car being stolen and so on. You understand something about the risk. It's the same thing with a board. If you're insuring against it, you're going to have to understand something about the risk. So, if you insure, take out cyber insurance as an organisation, your board is going to have, by the very fact that it's taking out that insurance, some understanding of cyber risk. And that's got to be a good thing for us in, cyber, in the cyber security business. So it should, hopefully, enable boards to see this as a normal risk, something that they need to put on their risk, risk register. Now, the other thing that it could do for, for businesses would be to say to them, look, Okay, there's a risk. You're going to introduce this new application. Um, there are problems with that. There are potentially risks in that, but you want to exploit new business opportunities and you want to do it quickly. Okay, well, we could spend six months getting the security right, or you could say, okay, I think the risk is this. I'm going to take out insurance and I'm going to go for it. So taking out insurance could help businesses exploit opportunities in conjunction with the security function, we would hope, so we would have a dialogue and a useful discussion with them, but actually it could help them to understand what they need to do to move forward swiftly with their um, exploiting new opportunities. So what else could it do? Well, <clears throat> I think it needs actuarial data. If you're doing insurance, you need actuarial data to be able to calculate premiums and risks. So, what would it do? It would say, you need to collect data. As an organization, you need to collect data about the security incidents and breaches you have, and you need to be able to report these and provide it to the insurer. Well, you know, that's got to be good, because most organizations now, frankly, don't monitor, don't collect data, don't understand data, don't know what to do with it, if they take out insurance, if they have to report it to their insurer, they are going to do something about that and they're going to put in place the controls that they need in order to be able to monitor cybersecurity incidents and breaches and actually report on them. Fantastic. The other thing that I think would be really great would be that the insurers would be collecting data across a whole group of organizations in different sectors, and you'd actually be able to start benchmarking them and say whether you're better or worse than others in your sector. If it works, that would be fantastic. 
What's the thing that most customers ask me for? Can you tell me whether I'm better or worse than my competitor? With cyber insurance, potentially, you could start to get that information and you could get it in a much more effective way than at the moment, which is really through survey data, which, as I say, is iffy at best. So the other thing that it would do, I believe, would be to help develop cybersecurity maturity. Because, okay, if you're paying a premium that is linked to your ability to control your cybersecurity, what are you going to do? You're going to say, I don't want my premium to go up. I'm going to improve my cybersecurity capability. Um, it's going to force you every year to review that because you've got to pay your premium every year. So you're going to have to have at least an annual review of your capability maturity. And insurers are probably going to insist on their own audit and their own minimum standards for security capability maturity. So it could be great from that point of view. And because insurers are going to want to find out as much as possible about the perpetrators of cyber crimes and attacks, they're going to start insisting on better digital forensics, which has got to be a good thing as well. So, I'm not going to go through this, but essentially what I'm saying in this little thing here is that cyber insurance could drive board level understanding of cyber risk, which could improve the number of uh, insurers, it could improve insurance limits, it could improve the business ownership of cyber risk, it could improve cyber security maturity. It could m do all these things, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, have a look at it for yourselves, but the whole point about this is that it could be a virtuous cycle, if you like. What would happen is if you got the insurer, the cyber insurance market working properly, it would help all these things, which would actually lift the um, overall cyber security, not only for individual organizations, but actually for the uh, whole country, I believe, and that would in turn develop the cybersecurity market and the cybersecurity market would in turn help develop cybersecurity globally. So I think there is an enormous, enormous potential for cybersecurity insurance. And I, I, I'm, I've got nothing, you know, I, I don't want to sound as if I'm selling cyber insurance. I've got absolutely nothing to do with the cyber insurance market. But when you think about what insurance has done, for all sorts of things over the 300 years or however long insurance has been around. It's improved safety in ships, it's improved safety in cars, it's improved burglar proofing in houses, it's improved health and safety. In insurance, actually, I know we all hate paying it, but it actually can have a really, really good effect on things. And I think it could have a really, really good effect on cybersecurity if it works, if we can get the market operating properly. Um, so, looking to the future, I think if we get this, this thing working properly, it can help organizations, companies, businesses to see cyber risk as a normal part of risk. It can help them to recognize that it's a normal part of risk which has to be dealt with through risk management. And they, they understand risk management. You know, they, they manage, businesses manage risk all the time. Why should cyber risk be seen as something different, something to be palmed off to the IT department the, the, the CISO, if they've got one, and ignored. It should be seen as a normal part of their risk management, their financial risk management, their operational risk management. So 
The other thing that it would do is because they're going to have to pay for this and they're going to have to understand it, then they're going to drive understanding throughout the organization. By driving understand, uh, understanding of cyber risk throughout the organization, it's going to increase risk awareness. So people are going to do fewer stupid things like clicking on that link or uh, giving somebody their password or choosing a, a, a really stupid password that's easy to guess. So driving the board level understanding, the board, if everybody says, oh, well, my senior management are all keen on this, I should get interested in keen on this, then it's going to drive better cyber security throughout the awareness, throughout the organization. The second raft of things I think that it's going to do, and this is something that I've been on about for so many years, how do we get the data? How do we get the understanding about security events and incidents and breaches? At the moment, nobody shares them for obvious reasons because they don't want people to know how insecure they are. If they have to share it with their insurer, then there's going to be a, a trusted third party who is going to be gain, gathering that information. Because the cyber insurance market works in the way it does, it's going to have to share that information, hopefully anonymized, but it's going to have to share it and it's going to have to use it to benchmark so that they understand how to set premiums so that they can do the underwriting calculations that they need to do. And it's got to be a good thing because everybody, all of us, when we go around and talk about security, we're going to have some real data to talk about instead of lies, damn lies and, and survey data. It's got to be a good thing to have some real concrete data for a change. Um, threats and vulnerabilities, you know. All that data, we, we've got a whole bunch of, of data about threats and vulnerabilities, but how significant are they? We don't know because nobody is, is saying. But if the insurance business is in there, they're going to have to find out about these things. And then finally, driving capability maturity. I think if we can get this to work, People are going to have to implement the controls that they need to implement in order to bring down their cyber risk. So they're going to have to meet the requirements of the insurer who's going to say to you to them, look, your premium, I mean it's it's like your car, you know, if you've got a car that you park on the street then you have to pay a higher premium than if you put it in a garage. If you've got a car with an immobiliser, you have to pay a lower premium than a car without an immobiliser. It's got to be the same thing for cyber insurance. If you've got the controls in place, and you can prove you've got the controls in place, and that you are mature about your cyber security capability, then you're going to have to be able to pay a lower premium. It's got to be a good thing. It's got to drive improvements. And these are going to be monitored because the insurers aren't going to just take your word for it. They're going to, in some cases, actually insist, particularly if they get burnt a bit. They're going to actually insist. They're actually going to do an audit. And they're going to find out whether it's true or not that you've got the controls that you say in place. And as I said before, they're going to have to be regularly reviewed and updated because you pay an annual premium. Right. I think that's it, actually. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>